Article 2, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Advantages of Faith in this Article that wonderful and superabundant are the blessings which flow to the human race from the belief and profession of this article we learn from these words of St. John, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God abideth in him, and he in God, and also from the words of Christ the Lord, proclaiming the Prince of the Apostles blessed for the confession of this truth, blessed art thou, Simon bar Jana, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. For this article is the most firm basis of our salvation and redemption. But is the fruit of these admirable blessings is best known by considering the ruin brought on man by his fall from that most happy state in which God had placed our first parents, let the pastor be particularly careful to make known to the faithful the cause of this common misery and calamity. When Adam had departed from the obedience due to God and had violated the prohibition, of every tree of paradise thou shalt eat, but if the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat, for in what day soever thou shalt eat of it, thou shalt die the death, he fell into the extreme misery of losing the sanctity and righteousness in which he had been placed, and of becoming subject to all those other evils which have been explained more fully by the Holy Council of Trent. Wherefore, the pastor should not omit to remind the faithful that the guilt and punishment of original sin were not confined to Adam, but justly descended from him, as from their source and cause, to all posterity. The human race, having fallen from its elevated dignity, no power of men or angels could raise it from its fallen condition and replace it in its primitive state. To remedy the evil and repair the loss it became necessary that the Son of God, whose power is infinite, clothed in the weakness of our flesh, should remove the infinite weight of sin and reconcile us to God in his blood. Necessity of faith in this article. The belief and profession of this our redemption, which God declared from the beginning, are now, and always have been, necessary to salvation. In the sentence of condemnation pronounced against the human race immediately after the sin of Adam the hope of redemption was held out in these words, which announced to the devil the loss he was to sustain by man's redemption, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed, she shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. The same promise God again often confirmed and more distinctly manifested to those chiefly whom he desired to make special objects of his favor, among others to the patriarch Abraham, to whom he often declared this mystery, but more explicitly when, in obedience to his command, Abraham was prepared to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Because, said God, thou hast done this thing, and hast not spared thy only begotten son F for my sake, I win bless thee and I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is by the seashore. Thy seed shall possess the gates of their enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. From these words it was easy to infer that he who was to deliver mankind from the ruthless tyranny of Satan was to be descended from Abraham, and that while he was the son of God, he was to be born of the seed of Abraham according to the flesh. Not long after, to preserve the memory of this promise, God renewed the same covenant with Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. When in a vision Jacob saw a ladder standing on earth, and its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God ascending and descending by it. As the scriptures testify, he also heard the Lord, who was leaning on the ladder, say to him, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land wherein thou sleepest, I will give to thee and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. Thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee and thy seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Nor did God cease afterwards to excite in the posterity of Abraham and in many others, the expectation of a Savior, by renewing the recollection of the same promise. For after the establishment of the Jewish state and religion it became better known to his people. Types signified and men foretold what and how great blessings the Saviour and Redeemer, Christ Jesus, was to bring to mankind. And indeed the prophets, whose minds were illuminated with light from above, foretold the birth of the Son of God, the wondrous works which he wrought while on earth, his doctrine, character, life, death, resurrection, 
and the other mysterious circumstances regarding him, and all these they announced to the people as graphically as if they were passing before their eyes. With the exception that one has reference to the future and the other to the past, we can discover no difference between the predictions of the prophets and the preaching of the apostles, between the faith of the ancient patriarchs and that of Christians. But we are now to speak of the several parts of this article. Jesus. Jesus is the proper name of the Godman and signified Savior, a name given him not accidentally, or by the judgment or will of man, but by the counsel and command of God. For the angel announced to Mary his mother, Behold thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He afterwards not only commanded Joseph, who was espoused to the virgin, to call the child by that name, but also declared the reason why he should be so called. Joseph, son of David, said the angel, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. In the sacred scriptures we meet with many who were called by this name. So, for example, was called the son of Nave, who succeeded Moses, and, by special privilege denied to Moses, conducted into the land of promise the people whom Moses had delivered from Egypt, and also the son of Jostak, the priest. But how much more appropriate it is to call by this name our Savior, who gave light, liberty and salvation, not to one people lonely, but to all men, of all ages to men oppressed, not by famine, or Egyptian or Babylonian bondage, but sitting in the shadow of death and fettered by the galling chains of sin and of the devil who purchased for them a right to the inheritance of heaven and reconciled them to God the Father. In those men who were designated by the same name we see foreshadowed Christ the Lord, by whom the blessings just enumerated were poured out on the human race. All other names which according to prophecy were to be given by divine appointment to the Son of God, are comprised in this one name Jesus, for while they partially signified the salvation which he wished to bestow upon us, this name included the force and meaning of all human salvation. Christ. To the name Jesus is added that of Christ, which signifies the anointed. This name is expressive of honor and office, and is not peculiar to one thing only, but common to many. For in the old law priests and kings, whom God, on account of the dignity of their office, commanded to he anointed, were called Christs. For priests commend the people to God by unceasing prayer, offer sacrifice to him, and turn away his wrath from mankind. Kings are entrusted with the government of the people, and to them principally belong the authority of the law, the protection of innocence and the punishment of guilt. As, therefore, both these functions seem to represent the majesty of God on earth, those who were appointed to the royal or sacerdotal office were anointed with oil. Furthermore, since prophets, as the interpreters and ambassadors of the immortal God, have unfolded to us the secrets of heaven and by salutary precepts and the prediction of future events have exhorted to amendment of life, it was customary to anoint them also. When Jesus Christ our Savior came into the world, he assumed these three characters of prophet, priest, and king, and was therefore called Christ, having been anointed for the discharge of these functions, not by mortal hand or with earthly ointment, but by the power of his heavenly Father and with a spiritual oil, for the plenitude of the Holy Spirit and a more copious effusion of all gifts than any other created being is capable of receiving or poured into his soul. This the prophet clearly indicates when he addresses the Redeemer in these words, Thou hast loved justice, and hated iniquity, therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The same is also more explicitly declared by the prophet Isaiah: The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me, he hath sent me to preach to the meek. Jesus Christ, therefore, was the great prophet and teacher from whom we have learned the will of God and by whom the world has been taught the knowledge of the Heavenly Father. The name Prophet belongs to him preeminently, because all others who were dignified with that name were his disciples, sent principally to announce the coming of that Prophet who was to save all men. Christ was also a priest, not indeed of the same order as were the priests of the tribe of Levi and the Old Law, but of that of which the Prophet David sang. Thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. 
this subject the Apostle fully and accurately develops in his epistle to the Hebrews. Christ not only as God, but also as man and partaker of our nature, we acknowledge to be a king. Of him the angel testified, he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. This kingdom of Christ is spiritual and eternal, begun on earth but perfected in heaven. He discharges by his admirable providence the duties of king towards his church, governing and protecting her against the assaults and snares of her enemies, legislating for her and imparting to her not only holiness and righteousness, but also the power and strength to persevere. But although the good and the bad are found within the limits of this kingdom, and thus all men by right belong to it, Yet those who in conformity with his commands lead unsullied and innocent lives, experience beyond all others the sovereign goodness and beneficence of our king. Although descended from the most illustrious race of kings, he obtained this kingdom not by hereditary or other human right, but because God bestowed on him as man all the power, dignity and majesty of which human nature is capable. To him, therefore, God delivered the government of the whole world, into this his sovereignty which has already commenced, all things shall be made full and entirely subject on the day of judgment. His only Son. In these words, mysteries more exalted with regard to Jesus are proposed to the faithful as objects of their belief and contemplation, namely, that he is the Son of God, and true God, like the Father who begot him from eternity. We also confess that he is the second person of the blessed Trinity, equal in all things to the Father and the Holy Ghost, for in the divine persons nothing unequal or unlike should exist, or even be imagined to exist, since we acknowledge the essence, will and power of all to be one. This truth is both clearly revealed in many passages of Holy Scripture and sublimely announced in the testimony of St. John, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But when we are told that Jesus is the Son of God, we are not to understand anything earthly or mortal of his birth, but are firmly to believe and piously to adore the birth by which, from all eternity, the Father begot the Son, a mystery which reason cannot fully conceive or comprehend, and at the contemplation of which, overwhelmed, as it were, with admiration, we should exclaim with the prophet, who shall declare his generation. On this point, then, we are to believe that the Son is of the same nature, of the same power and wisdom, with the Father, as we more fully profess in these words of the Nicene Creed, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, born of the Father before all ages, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial to the Father, by whom all things were made. Among the different comparisons employed to elucidate the mode and manner of this eternal generation that which is borrowed from the production of thought in our mind seems to come nearest to its illustration, and hence St. John calls the Son the Word. For as our mind, in some sort understanding itself, forms an image of itself, which theologians express by the term Word, so God, as far as we may compare human things to divine, understanding himself, begets the eternal Word. It is better, however, to contemplate what faith proposes, and in the sincerity of our souls to believe and confess that Jesus Christ is true God and true man, as God, begotten of the Father before all ages, as man, born in time of Mary, his virgin mother. While we thus acknowledge his twofold nativity, we believe him to be one Son, because his divine and human natures meet in one person. As to his divine generation he has no brethren nor killers, being the only begotten Son of the Father, while we mortals are the work of his hands. But if we consider his birth as man, he not only calls many by the name of brethren, but treats them as such, since he admits them to share with him the glory of his paternal inheritance. They are those who by faith have received Christ the Lord, and who really, and by works of charity, show forth the faith which they profess in words. Hence the Apostle calls Christ, the firstborn amongst many brethren. Our Lord. Of our Saviour many things are recorded in sacred scripture. Some of these, it is evident, apply to him as God and some as man, because from his two natures he received the different properties which belong to both. Hence we say with truth that Christ is almighty, eternal, infinite, and these attributes he has from his divine nature, again, we say of him that he suffered 
died, and rose again, which are properties manifestly that belong to his human nature. Besides these terms, there are others common to both natures, as when in this article of the Creed we say our Lord. If, then, this name applies to both natures, rightly is he to be called our Lord. For as he, as well as the Father, is the eternal God, so is he Lord of all things equally with the Father, and as he and the Father are not the one, one God, and the other, another God, but one and the same God, so likewise he and the Father are not the one, one Lord, and the other, another Lord. As man, he is also for many reasons appropriately called our Lord. First, because he is our Redeemer, who delivered us from sin, he deservedly acquired the power by which he truly is and is called our Lord. This is the doctrine of the Apostle. He humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. For which cause God also hath exalted him, and hath given him a name which is above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, of those that are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of God the Father. And of himself he said, after his resurrection, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. He is also called Lord because in one person both natures, the human and the divine, are united, and even though he had not died for us, he would have yet deserved, by this admirable union, to be constituted common Lord of all created things, particularly of the faithful who obey and serve him with all the fervor of their souls. Duties owed to Christ our Lord. It remains, therefore, that the pastor remind the faithful that, from Christ we take our name and are called Christians, that we cannot be ignorant of the extent of his favors particularly since by his gift of faith we are enabled to understand all these things. We, above all others, are under the obligation of devoting and consecrating ourselves forever, like faithful servants, to our Redeemer and our Lord. This indeed, we promised at the doors of the church when about to be baptized, for we then declared that we renounced the devil and the world, and gave ourselves unreservedly to Jesus Christ. But if to be enrolled as soldiers of Christ we consecrated ourselves by so holy and solemn a profession to our Lord, what punishments should we not deserve if after our entrance into the church, and after having known the will and laws of God and received the grace of the sacraments, we were to form our lives upon the precepts and maxims of the world and the devil, just as though when cleansed in the waters of baptism, we had pledged our fidelity to the world and to the devil, and not to Christ the Lord and Saviour. What heart so cold as not to be inflamed with love by the kindness and good will exercised toward us by so great a Lord, who, though holding us in his power and dominion as slaves ransomed by his blood, yet embraces us with such ardent love as to call us not servants, but friends and brethren. This, assuredly, supplies the most just, and perhaps the strongest, claim to induce us always to acknowledge, venerate, and adore him as our Lord.